Your congregation, please turn to the brief order of forgiveness, confession and forgiveness of sins, printed on page one of your alternative su supplement, Kimball supplement. We begin this morning's service on this, uh, this Pentecost Sunday in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sin to God, who is faithful and just, and who has promised to forgive to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <laughs> Most merciful God, have mercy upon us. us. We, we confess, confess to you that we have sinned against you, you with thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not trusted you with all of our heart, we have not left another good deed and truth. In your compassion, forgive our sins. our light and our truth. Amen. With great joy I proclaim to you that Almighty God, rich in mercy, abundant in love, forgives you all of your sins and grants you newness of life in Jesus Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. The Curie on the top of page 2.
salutation on page six.
works, O Lord, in wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Psalm 104. The second reading for today, and the text for today's sermon, is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Follow along in your today's reading bulletin insert. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came the sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared upon them, and a tongue rested on each one of them. All, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under the heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, the crowd gathered, and they were bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked one another, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's mighty deeds of power. All were amazed. All were perplexed, and they said to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and mocked and scoffed, and they said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice, and he addressed them, and he said this, Men of Judea, and all who live here at Jerusalem, let it be known unto you, and listen to what I have to say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel, chapter 2, beginning with verse 28. In the last days it will be, God declares, I shall pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they too shall prophesy. And I will show portents in heaven above, and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. And the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the, great, of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then, then, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here ends the second reading for today. Will the congregation please rise and join in singing our appointed gospel verse. On uh, page 7.
If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, a paraclete, to be, you, to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides in you, and he will be with you. I have said these things to you while I am still here with you, but the advocate, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father has sent in my name, will teach you everything and remind you all that I have said to you. Peace I leave to you, and my peace I give you. I do not give you the peace that the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them make you afraid. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Will the congregation please be seated? <laughs> Pentecost on Sunday, we thank you for the opportunity to gather at St. Paul's Wurttemberg today to wrestle with this amazing text found in the gospel, found in the book of Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Open our hearts and minds so that we might understand the birth of the church and how your Holy Spirit was poured out back then and it still applies today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, now, follow along in your Today's Readings Bulletin insert and or bring your Bible and write in it, right? That would be a good idea. Bring your Bible to church, right? So Acts chapter 2, verse 1, is the text that we read today, Pentecost Sunday. Okay, stop. What is Pentecost Sunday? All right, now, Easter, when is Easter every year? First Sunday after the first full moon of the spring equinox. Easter is a movable feast. It moves around. It moves around this way. And as a result, if we have a late Easter or an early Easter, it moves around the rest of the church calendar. So the center of the church calendar is Easter Sunday. So this year, Easter was 50 days ago, okay? So Easter Sunday plus 40 is, the ascent, is Ascension Day. It's always on a Thursday. Easter Sunday plus 50 is today, Pentecost Sunday. So what is it? Seven, seven Sabbath days times seven weeks is 49. 49 plus one is 50, okay? So 50 days. The, the name Pentecost means in Greek, the 50. It means 50, 50 days. So 50 days after Easter. So next Sunday, we're going to have Trinity, Holy Trinity Sunday. And then after that, it's the third Sunday, the fourth Sunday, the fifth Sunday, on up to like the 25th Sunday after Pentecost. So Pentecost is a very important event. Now, what is it anyway? What is this thing? Is it a Christian holiday or a Christian day? Yes and no. Actually, it's rooted back here in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. If you remember the story, Moses, what does Moses do? He leads the children of Israel out of captivity, slavery in Egypt. That's the Passover story. Remember the Passover story? You slay a lamb, you put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and the lentil, and the angel of death passes over the ten plagues, right? Pa um, Passover plus 50 is Pentecost. So what does it commemorate? It commemorates two things. The first thing, when they got settled in the Promised Land, it, it's the first fruits or a harvest festival. Um, have you mowed the lawn a lot this year? Mm. Yeah, the grass is really growing for some reason, right? Farmers are baling hay right now because the, 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 the hay fields are, are so high right now. So in the Middle East, this is the harvest of the barley and wheat crop, okay? Is that sort of important? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, bread, right? People eat barley and wheat. Without that, you're in big trouble. Right now they're talking about, oh, the farmers are getting killed because of the price of diesel fuel. Oh, the farmers are getting killed because of fertilizer. So the Midwest right now, people are worried. It's also a drought situation out there like in Western Kansas right now. So wheat is a big deal. We need wheat today, just like they needed it in the ancient world. It's kind of the, the, main, the mainstay of the whole, the whole uh, economic system. So what do they do? They take, a, they take the wheat from the first harvest, and they make two loaves, and they bring it to the temple, and they offer that as a sacrifice to God. First fruits, right? What are you supposed to do? When you get paid, your first fruits should go to God's work, go to the church. Right? What do we do? Normally we wait and see what's left over after a paycheck. We live paycheck to paycheck, and usually that's like a dollar. So we have that much left at the end. No, you're supposed to honor God first. Seek ye what? First, 
the kingdom of God. Right? So first fruits offering, very important. Now, there are three pilgrim feasts that are outlined in the Old Testament. So if you're a Jewish person in the first century AD, you have three feasts. The first one is Passover, the second one is Pentecost, and the third one in the fall is called Tabernacles or Booths. You're supposed to build a lean-to in your backyard, and it commemorates the, the wilderness wandering for 40 years. So what are they doing? They acted out to teach the kids the story of the Old Testament. Okay, so you act it out. That's what's going on here. So this is a pilgrim feast. What does that mean? You are required, if you are a Jewish person, and if you can, you're required to go to Jerusalem three times a year. It's a pilgrimage. This Pentecost is a one-day festival, one day, okay? And it's a joyous festival, it's a celebration, the first fruits. Now, what happened after August 10, 70 AD? First of all, what is that date again? The destruction of the second temple, 5th, 10th, 12th, and 15th Roman legion destroyed the temple. Can you offer a first fruits offering at a temple that no longer exists? The answer would be no. So, what do you do? Pentecost becomes a festival commemorating the giving of the law, the giving of the Torah to Moses. So what happens? Moses goes where? Up Mount Sinai, and he comes down with what? The law, okay? So you go up the mountain, down. Uh, Bobby did a great job reading Genesis chapter 11. What's that? The Tower of Babel story. What's that all about? We're all together in one place, all speaking one language. And what happened? We decided to build a tower. So here we are, human beings. Where's God up there? We're going to reach God on our own initiative. We're going to build a tower up to God's way. What did God do? He scrambled the languages and dispersed people. Why is that? Why is that? Isn't unity a good thing? Actually, if you follow the news like I do, when you get people together, what did they do? They do heinous things like, let's do, a, uh, let's do an ethnic cleansing and kill all the wrong people. Let's uh, just do that. So God scrambled the languages to protect us from ourselves, mm. right? Well, my daughter Jenna, she was like two, three years old. She's a precocious one, you know. What did she like to do? She liked to stick things in, in the light socket. Right? <laughs> now what do I do? As a good parent, I would say, I don't want to scar her psychologically. We'll let her do whatever she wants. Yeah, that's what pets of parents do today. In fact, here, have some money and go stick your finger in the light socket, right? So what do you do? As a loving father, you say, no, Jenna, don't do that. And you buy little guards to make sure you keep an eye on, make sure they don't destroy themselves. Well, that's what the Tower of Babel story is all about. God and his love protected us from ourselves. Do we need to be protected from ourselves? Yeah, a lot. Put away all the sharp objects, right? right? We're into self-destruction here. So the Tower of Babel is we try to reach God. All religions are based on the idea of law, 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 law. You know, I'm going to keep the law and I'm going to reach God on my own. That's what Islam is all about. Okay? So what is Pentecost? It's the reverse Tower of Babel. The reason Bobby read that is because the Babel story goes this way. The Pentecost story goes this way. Right? The Holy Spirit comes down to us. So this is the Babel, the Babel picture. This is the Pentecost story, down this way. The Pentecost story is similar to Moses going up on Mount Sinai, receiving the law, and bringing it down and giving it to the people. Okay? So these all fit in together. These are powerful symbols and images that are working here. Now, it's the day of Pentecost, and they're all together in one place. Heard that one before, right? Who's they? Well, it's the 11 apostles minus Judas and then if you read Acts chapter 1 they drew straws and they selected Matthias so they have the two, number 12 is restored again 12 apostles and how many disciples remember you have to make a distinction when you read the Bible there's disciples, students and there's apostles there's a fixed number of apostles you can't be an apostle but you are a disciple of Christ see the distinction? Mm -hmm. so there's maybe 120 people and they're together in the, in the, all together in one place in an upper room. What upper room? We think this is the same room where the Last Supper was given. Okay? In the night in which he was betrayed. Okay? It, we think it's the same room. If you go to Jerusalem now, they'll show you the upper room. And it's sort of like, you just sort of go with it when the tour guide tells you that, you know? Even if it's the wrong time, you know? But for centuries, people think that this is the room that the Last Supper is given. So they're all together in one place. What are they doing? They're waiting. Why? Because Jesus told them to wait. Remember? 
He ri he's rise from the dead, Easter Sunday morning. How many post-resurrection appearances between the resurrection and the ascension? Ten recorded appearances. Ascension day, where does Jesus go? He goes to the Mount of Olives over here, and he goes up. He goes up, doesn't he? Is that the end of the story? Birth of Christ, death of Christ, life of Christ, life of Christ death of Christ, resurrection, ascension of Christ, and P, Pentecost. So Jesus goes up, 10 days later, the Holy Spirit comes down. So there's a lot of up and down going on here today, okay? So Pentecost is very important. The story does not end with Jesus' resurrection and then 40 days later ascending to heaven and that's the end of the story, we can get back to business now. No, the Holy Spirit plays a very important role, especially in the works of Luke. What did Luke write? Luke and Acts. So Acts is what? It's Top Gun Maverick. It's the sequel to the Gospel of Luke, okay? So see how that works? Okay, so very important to read Luke. So, um, so, so the Holy Spirit plays a central role driving the church from where? From Jerusalem, that's the center, outward. Pretend like you take a rock and throw it into a pond and you see the ripples go out like this. It starts in Jerusalem. This is 33 AD, 50 days after Easter. And by the time you get to the end of the book of Acts, Paul is in Rome. So how did the gospel go from here, Jerusalem, all the way over to Rome? How did that happen? That's the book of Acts. It helps to understand how the gospel got spread throughout the world. And today is a central event. This is a rich, deep text. So let's get to work here. Um, it's Pentecost. They're all together in one place. And they're behind locked doors. You know, they're all together. They're all together having a great time. Is it good to get together? Yeah. After COVID, we love to get together, right? And I, during the sharing of the peace, I have to throw cold water on you because everybody's like hugging and kissing and shaking hands and everything. It's like, no, we have the rest of the service to do, right? So we like to be together. Is it good to be together? Yes. But if they just stayed in the upper room, we wouldn't be Christian today. It's very important that we are called to come to church. Yes, I want you to come to church. I want you to learn the Bible, but your work is really out the door. It's not in here, okay? So they're all together in one place, and suddenly, okay? What does suddenly mean? They weren't expecting it, right? They're just chilling out. They're probably watching the Paramount Plus channel, Perry Mason reruns. They're up to year six, uh, episode seven. That's what I'm working on right now, right? So suddenly, there's... God has other plans. From heaven, okay, where's heaven? Okay, heaven's up there, God's up there, we're down here, okay? There came the sound like the rush of a violent wind. What did it sound like? I'm gonna do it, I say it every year. Just been out to Oklahoma, you know. Yeah, but in, in Oklahoma, the best thing to do is to watch the weather, right? Because they always have tornado warnings, it's a fantastic thing. They, they preempt all the programming. They call up my father, what's going on? There's a tornado warning. He's standing in the street. He's 91 with his <laughs> oxygen looking for the tornado. I don't see it yet. Meantime, you know, Linda's going crazy, right? So what happens? The tornadoes always hit the trailer park. Yeah. It's unbelievable. I don't know what this is. There's something about trailers and tornadoes. They're attracted to each other, right? So there's a wreckage of a, tor of, of a trailer park in the background. And there's a guy like Tom McRitchie standing there with a wife beater shirt on and a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And what does he say? He goes like this. Well, what do you think of this damage, sir? Oh, it's really bad. Well, what are you gonna do about it? What did it sound like? It sounded like a freight train coming through the trailer park. The sound like the rush of a mighty wind. The guy's a Christian, right? Right, that's what it sounds like. Well, what are, you, what are your plans now? We're gonna rebuild. Why don't you leave and move somewhere else, you idiot, right? You don't live in a trailer in Oklahoma. You just don't do that, right? You live in a bunker, right? So, so it sounded like a freight train coming through the trailer park. That's the sound of the rush of a mighty wind, okay? And what? It filled the entire house where they were sitting, right? Well, what does that look like? I don't know, but it, it must have, it sounded like this huge rushing sound, right? It's an incredible thing. Is that normal? No. No, it's like, it, maybe it's normal for me because Mrs. Isaacs vacuums a lot. <laughs> Sounds like the sound of a rush of a mighty wind. It fills the whole house. You know, the dog runs away, right? Okay, so it fills the entire house. And suddenly, right, divided tongues as a fire appeared upon them. And a tongue rested in each one of them. Is this normal? No, this is very strange, right? This is a supernatural event that's happening here. And notice, it's, it's audio. You hear it? 
and you see it, audio visual, okay? And who saw this? How many people? 120, another. in other words, was it one person who had a psychotic experience? They took LSD and were hallucinating or something? No, it's a collective thing. Many, 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 many people saw this. That's very important, you know. It's not a subjective experience, it's objective. And so, divided tongues. Now, what is this all about, right? Luke tries to explain it. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me talk about that for a minute. See the word spirit, right? In English, we use the word spirit, right? It's spiritu, it comes from the Latin, right, spirit. In Hebrew, it's ruach, R-U-A-C-H. What is that? Back in the book of Genesis, it says, and the spirit of God, the ruach, hovered around, the, hovered over the water, the deep, right? So the spirit is part of the creation experience. When you're dead, you ex Spire, expire, spear, spirit, you know, your spire, your spirit goes out, you expire, okay? So the ruach is the spirit that animates. What is Adam anyway? Adam is dirt man. Adam, Adam means dirt, man of dirt. And God did what? He ruached into the dirt and gave Adam life. Life, ruach, spirit. Now in the Greek, you know this word too. Panuma, pneumonia, pneumonia, P-N-E-U, right? That means spirit. The Greek word is panuma, spirit. The Hebrew word is ruach, and it's all over the place in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So this is the Holy Spirit. He's the third member of the Holy Trinity. If I were you, I would make sure you're in church next Sunday. Why? Because we're going to do the Athanasian Creed because Bobby loves it so much. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to talk about the Holy Trinity. Right, the one time of the year where we talk about the big thing. We begin today's service in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You want to come and then learn about the relationship. How does that all work? So Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in, tongue, in languages, tongues, other as the Spirit gave them ability. Okay, stop for a minute. What is the thing about the flame shooting up here? If you read the Talmud, there's a commentary and it says that rabbis, when they study the Torah, if they reach a particularly delicious point, a flame appears above their head. You know, we see cartoons, you know, where someone has an idea and the light bulb comes on. Yeah. Okay? I get this way when I'm reading, like, economics books. <laughs> Ludwig von Mises, Maureen Rothbard, all of a sudden, like, flames shooting out of my head because it's such <laughs> great, delicious stuff. Right? So this, this idea of a flame shooting out of your head is not, like, as weird as it sounds. It means, like, enlightenment. Mm -hmm. I saw the light. I'm filled with this inspirational idea. Right? Spiritual idea. And they began to speak in languages. Okay, stop for a minute. What are we talking about here? You know, I, I, I'm a really boring person, so I just sort of sit around and watch TV all the time. And sometimes there's nothing on. You know, QVC is on. Uh, that's usually on all the time at our house, but sometimes I, I'm allowed to watch other things, and so I flip through the... Sometimes there's religious programming. And what's a religious program? The Pentecostal people... Uh, it seems to have a monopoly on religious broadcasting in America. And what is this? Azusa Street Revival in, outside of Los Angeles in 1906, that's the beginning of the Pentecostal movement. 1906, so it's a fairly recent development. And what is it? During the worship service, they speak in tongues. So they would stand up and they start babbling and talking, you know. Now, what is that called? That's called glossolalia, right? Is this something that we've never heard of before? Well, Paul in 1 Corinthians, the church in Corinth has problems, right? Uh, they have people jumping up in the middle of the service doing glossolalia, disrupting things. We're Germans, we're Lutheran, we like good order. Okay? It begins at the beginning, ends at the end, we like good order. You don't interrupt the service with glossolalia. Paul says, yeah, you think you're, you're great, you're special, you're hot stuff because you speak in tongues? I speak in tongues probably more than the rest of you people do, right? But when you speak in tongues, there are rules. It has to be in good order, and you have to have a translator or an interpreter. Well, why is that? God is not, God is very efficient. He doesn't waste things, okay? So God's not gonna give you the gift of glossolalia and you stand up and babble and rant for no reason at all, and it has to be to proclaim the gospel of Christ, right? It has to have a translator, it has to have a purpose to it. So glossolalia, 
This is not glossolalia that's going on here. These people are not like speaking in tongues, babbling for no apparent reason. Again, what, what's wrong with tongues? We don't do this in the Lutheran tradition uh, for a number of reasons. The number one reason is that we believe that God, the canon of scripture is closed with Revelation 22. It, when the Revelation's it. So we don't get words of knowledge or special insights from the Holy Spirit to find your car keys or something, okay? So we believe that, that the revelations from God stopped there, okay? And we also believe that we, we know from um, Pentecostal churches that it leads to a spiritual elite. So within a congregation, is unity a good thing? Yes. Do you want to have five or 10% of our congregation that thinks we're special or something? You know, because we speak in tongues that makes us a spiritual elite and the rest of you people have to serve us? That's what happens. It divides the congregation, right? And again, God does not give you the gift of gloss lay to make you feel good because you have low self-esteem or something. It must have a purpose and a function, and that's to preach the gospel. This is not glossolalia here. It's xenoglossia, okay? What's xeno? You've heard of the word xenophobic? That's fear of foreigners. Xeno is foreigner. Xenoglossia means the ability to speak foreign languages. So what's the function of this thing? The function of this thing is they're all together in one place. And who are these people? Galilean Jews. Okay? Who are they? Peter's a fisherman. He lives up in Galilee. The people in Galilee have a distinctive accent. Right? Is it the uh, Last Temptation of Christ? Harvey Keitel plays Peter and he speaks with a Brooklyn accent. Well, that would be probably a correct way to understand it. Right? People with a Brooklyn accent. You watch the World War II movies. The lovable lunkhead from Brooklyn is always the first guy to get it. So you don't want to be the lovable lunkhead in a World War II movie. They're always the first one to get it, right? Or if someone's from Arkansas or Tennessee, like you know, they speak English, sort of, but the way they, they talk, it's, a, it's an odd thing. Well, that's the way Galileans were, okay? They spoke Aramaic, but it had a funny accent, and people from Jerusalem, Judea, could tell that they're, they, they're odd. They're from, they're from Galilee. They can tell by talking to you, okay? So these are Galileans. And what does Peter do for a living? He's a good example. What does he do? He's a fisherman. He's a working stiff dude. Okay? He's like a, he's a working dude. Right? He's not a highly educated guy. Right? Does he have a time to, uh, you know, take the, uh, the Babel course, you know, <laughs> to pick up a few extra languages on the side to, you know, so you can order things at a French restaurant or something? What do I order at a French restaurant? Give me the French fries and the French toast, Pierre. Yeah, I love you. I love French food. Right? Okay? So he's not, Peter's not like this. He's like, no. So instead... You have a problem here. How do you explain the fact that these working stiff dudes with the funny accents from Galilee are speaking all these odd languages? It's xenoglossia, right? The ability to speak foreign languages. And who are these people? Well, look, you know, they, a big crowd gathers because they hear the sound of the rush of the mighty wind. They hear the tornado come through the trailer park. And each one of them, they heard the apostles and disciples speaking and preaching the gospel, which is what? The death, burial, resurrection of Christ in the languages that they understood. Where are these people from anyway? Well, you take out a map. Remember, we read the Bible, you've got to have a map, right? There are 12 different regions mentioned, right? And depending on how you group it, sometimes it could be 15. So there are 12 to 15 of these, right? The first group is, ready? Um, Parthia, Media, and the Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia. Okay, stop. What's that? This is the Roman Empire, right? You've got to have this when you read the New Testament. The Romans conquer all the territory around the Mediterranean, corn, wine, and oil. Do they care about Arabia? No. Right? Do they care about, like, over here? Not really. Do they care about the German, Germania? No, they can never beat the Germans, right? But the, the arch enemies of the Romans are the Parthenians. How long did they fight the Parthenians? Oh, 500 years, right? Around the year uh, 275 uh, AD, um, Valatian, he was a Roman emperor. He was leading Roman legions down into Parthia, which is Iran, Persia, the Iranians, right? And what happened to him? He was captured, taken alive, and they held him for ransom, and finally they just killed him. They, they skinned him alive. They flayed him. He's the only Roman emperor to be captured in battle to be, by the Parthenians. Are the Parthenians tough dudes? Yeah. Victor Davis Hanson writes about this, right? He writes about ancient history. 
the, the Iranians, the Persians, the Parthenians have been a pain in the neck for the West for like the entire time they've been around, like thousands of years, right? Iran, don't be surprised. Iran's always a problem. It's like a thorn in our side of Western civilization. So the Parthenians, why is Parthenia and Media and uh, Mesopotamia important? This is outside of the Roman Empire. This is just, it's out here. It's, it's not, not in the colored zone. It's out here. Why is that interesting? Well, there were Jews in the diaspora. How many Jews at this time, according to Flavius Josephus? About 8 million Jews living in, the, living in this area. 2 million live in Israel, Palestine. The other 6 million are living out in the hinterland, including Parthia. Right? Babylon. Remember, some of, the, some of the Jews never came back from the Babylonian captivity. They stayed there. Right? So there are Jews living out here. Well, what are they doing in Jerusalem then? Well, they come for the three mm -hmm. pilgrimages. Passover, Pentecost, and Booths. So the city of Jerusalem is a small town. I actually walked around the outer, outer wall of it, you know, when I was there. And, but there were people camping up in the hills. Josephus says two million pilgrims. That's probably a high number. A lot of people in town. Right? So they're all camped out. And they're from all over the all over the Roman Empire and even outside the Roman Empire. As a Greco-Roman reader of Acts, which is who Luke is writing for, you would say, wow, that's really interesting. Exotic people from far away are becoming Christian, right? So Parthians meets, right? And then you sort of go on a tour, uh, tour around uh, Pontus, right? Pontius Pilate, that's the north, north uh, sorry, the south shore of the Black Sea, okay? Um, and then you just go right around. And it, you, it takes you from Jerusalem and kind of out, 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 all the way to Rome, okay? So the idea is there are Jews who speak these languages other than Hebrew and Aramaic, like they speak Latin or they speak Parthian or, you know, Farsi, whatever the language of, of the Parthenians happens to be. And they all hear the Galileans doing what? Preaching the gospel in their own language. It's like a UN translator booth, okay? Now, is that a miracle? Is that a strange thing? That's an amazing thing. Again, what's the purpose of it? It's not glossolalia to make these people feel good about themselves because they have low self-esteem. No, it's so that they can bring the gospel to the world. It's a functional thing, okay? Xenoglossia, very important point, right? Now, they're all amazed and astonished. Why? Because it's a miracle that this happened, right? I took Spanish in high school. Yeah, for poor Mr. Rossi, he was the football coach and he, he was Italian, but they had him speaking Spanish. Right? Man. How did I do in that one? <laughs> Not good, okay? So, so, so I could have used the Holy Spirit to get me through the final exam, you know? You know, you know? All right? So if you don't study, it doesn't do any good to invoke God, right? You gotta, you gotta hit the books, right? So anyway, so they're amazed and perplexed that this miracle that takes place. These dudes, we know these guys, they're like working, all of a sudden they're speaking language. All right? So they say, what does this mean? Stop. Is that sort of important? We're going to see in a couple of minutes, Peter steps up to the plate. And what is he? He is the interpreting angel. Very important point. When something happens in the Bible, you have to have, especially like Revelation stuff. What does this mean? The angel comes and tells you the meaning of the event. Do we, do we have that problem today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? An event happens, well then, what's the narrative, right? So who gets to be the interpreting angel? Well, if you watch Fox News or MSNBC or CNN, they are the interpreting angel that tell you the true narrative of that event, mm. right? So what does that mean for you? Caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, right? If you're following current events, you should read like multiple things and watch multiple things. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle there. What's their narrative? What are they trying to do? They're trying to be the interpreting angel to tell you what it means, right? So you have to be, very, be skeptical and be careful about that. What, what do I do? I have certain people that I've been following for years. Like I watch Larry Kudlow at four o'clock on Fox Business News. He's an economist. He's like 81 or something now. The guy's in great shape. And I, and I understand his analysis of the money supply and the you know, fiscal policy and that sort of thing. So pick somebody that you kind of rely on and you know, he, he, he's, he's, he's credible for me. So he's my interpreting angel when it comes to economic things, okay? So, so, so pick somebody that you trust in other words, right? So Peter is the interpreting angel that stands up and says, what does this mean? Now stop, 
Are there other voices out there that want to tell you what it means? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, here, look at this story. What does this mean? Mockers and sneers. Cynical people stand up and say, they're filled with new wine. Okay, what does that mean? Well, there's always somebody out there that has some bizarre way of explaining something. Right? Um, again, going back to the Civil War, I use this example all the time. July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 1863, the Battle of Gettysburg. What did the Battle of Gettysburg mean? Well, Abraham Lincoln gives the Gettysburg Address, November 19th, 1863, and he gave the, uh, the blood that was shed on the battlefield of Gettysburg, right, a, a purpose and a meaning. It wasn't just a pointless slaughter, okay? So the narrative, what does it mean, is an extremely important thing to follow, and you have to be skeptical and cynical and read other sources, beware the man of one book, right? And, and be careful where you get and who you trust. Be open-minded, but also be careful about who you listen to. Mm -hmm. Well, so if you would have said, well, they're all drunk, okay? What are these snarky people getting to when they say that? Um, in Greece, they have religious people there, don't they? In Corinth, right? Where the sins of the East meet the vices of the West. It's a sailor town, Corinth. And they have a lot of, a lot of they're polytheistic. They have many temples. So they have sacred prostitutes there, and the women wear a lot of makeup and they speak in tongues. Okay, glossolalia. They're not Christian. So if you said to, if, if Paul, if a, if a Corinthian woman said, well, you're very religious, well, that, they mean that you're a temple prostitute. That's not a compliment. Paul wants women to be, Christian women, to be of good report. Okay? So what do you mean, new wine? What does that, what does that mean? Greek people who are religious, you can be a follower of Dionysius or Bacchus. Well, what does that mean? Well, they're, they're, they drink until they see the gods, right? They have a chemically induced mystical experience, you know, like the 60s, okay? And so these people are religious people in Greece. They're followers of Dionysius. So what are they saying here? They're going, these aren't real Jews. These are Greek people that are acting like they're followers of Dionysius. That's a major slam. That's a major put down, right? It's more than just they're drunk and stupid. No, these people are pagans. The way they're, they, the way here they are at a, at a Jewish festival, and they're acting like Greek people. See how that works? Okay. But Peter stands up, interpreting angel, and he stands him up with the eleven in the background. Okay, what does that mean? You ever watch on TV where anytime you know Mayor Adams stands there, he doesn't stand there alone. There's like fifteen people standing in the back, and they're like. Uh, looking around like this, you know, I always look at their faces in the background, you know. So it, it gives you more authority if you have people standing behind you. It's sort of like, it isn't just his opinion, it's the opinion of all these brilliant politicians, okay. So he stands up with them, and he stands up because of classical rhetoric. He raises his voice. Why does he do that? He's addressing maybe a thousand people, okay. You ever listen to Douglas MacArthur, his funny speech, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Old soldiers never die. Why does he talk that way? Because he's used to speaking without a microphone in front of a thousand people. So you have to like wait for your voice to hit the back of the room. So Peter is speaking without a microphone in a loud voice and he's addressing them. And he says, first of all, he opens, men of Judah, who? People who live in the greater Jerusalem area, right? Of the tribe of Judah, right? And all those who live here, right? How many people are in Jerusalem? Well, two million people, the tourists are there. Maybe they've probably been there since Passover, right? They've been there for, for you know, seven weeks so far. Let it be known unto you and listen to what I have to say. Okay, is that important? Yeah. When you come to church, when you go to a lecture, when you go to a seminar, you're paying to be there, especially a seminar. Listen to what the speaker has to say. Do we have a problem with that? Yeah, we have multiple distractions. People are checking out their iPhone, you know, looking on Facebook instead of paying attention to the lecture. You know, it used to kill me. I'd be up there lecturing in front of my college students and you're like, your parents are paying $45,000 a year for you to sit here and look at your iPhone instead of listening to the genius professor, right? <laughs> you know, when you, when you go to something, like take a couple of the Ritalin tabs or something and pay attention to what the speaker has to say. You don't have to agree with the speaker, but you need to listen. So Peter's telling, listen, listen to me. Look, these men are not drunk as you suppose. What is he doing? He's ripping out the guts of their argument. These people aren't drunk. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Even followers of Bacchus and Dionysius don't drink until noon. It's noon somewhere, right? 
So nine o'clock in the morning, Peter is like, he's, he's using snark back on them, right? That's one thing about being snarky and using satire. People can't stand it because you, you, cut, you cut them right in the heart when you do that. So Peter's being snarky here, right? Um, and, and, um, and no, these people aren't drunk, right? Stop. Is it interesting that Peter is the spokesman? Why do you care what Peter has to say? I'll tell you why. Peter's been there and done that. Do you want to listen to some young guy who's like 22 or something rendering their philosophy of life? Not really. Go back to Bard and take some more graduate courses or something, right? You want to talk to some old guy, you know, like Steve Cole, right? <laughs> who's been around the block, who's been beaten up, who's been run over in the parking lot, who's been abused. He's, he's a, suffer, a, love, a life of suffering and pain. Amen. That's who you want to listen to, right? Why? Well, how about Peter? Has he been through the mill? Yeah, he was a fisherman, mind his own business. He follows Jesus. Then what happens? Three and a half years, he's been, he sees the risen Lord. Then he denies Jesus three times, and then he's forgiven, right? Right? So when Peter talks, guess what? He's an expert, Yeah. right? So when these people start shooting their mouth off, the interpreting angel people, you say, well, where do you get your opinions from? What, where does this come from? I make it up because I'm a creative writer and I'm on drugs. Well, that's probably don't listen to people like that. <laughs> Peter is a guy that you want to listen to, right? So his authority, his expertise is, look, I've been with the J-man. I denied him. I've been forgiven. I saw the risen Lord. Yeah, that's why I'm up here talking, and I'm going to be the interpreting angel. I'm going to tell you what the Bible has to say about it. Do we care about everybody's opinion? We seem to. Do we care what the Bible says about it? No, not really. Well, maybe that's why your life is a wreck. You need to see what the Bible says about it. So what does Peter do? He doesn't say, in my humble opinion, and his opinion would be valuable. He doesn't do that. He says, look, the prophet Joel, where? Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. He says this. Here's what the prophet Joel said. Now stop. Let me do the prophet Joel for a minute. Who is he? There are 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament. 12. Okay? Little short books. Right? This one, we're not quite sure when it was written. And all of chapter 1, it's somewhere back, you know, between 800 and 400 B.C., a long time ago. And he's talking about a plague of locusts that come down from the north. Who are these? First of all, is a plague of locusts a good thing? Mm -mm. Here's what locusts do. They eat everything and anything. And it completely right down to the dirt, right? So if you have a plague of locusts, it means your economy is ruined. It's like COVID on steroids. It destroys everything in its way, right? Who are the plague of locusts? They're either the Assyrian army or the Babylonian army coming down from the north. And what do they do? They burn your town. They burn your crops. Scorch your... You watch the coverage of what's going on in the, in the Ukraine. How long is it going to take these people to rebuild their economy? How long until the Ukraine is the, is the breadbasket of Europe? They, it's like Kansas. They grow wheat there. Are you going to plant your crops this year with Russian sh artillery shelling your, your farm? Well, that's what a plague of locusts does. They destroy the economy. They enslave people. They kill people. They do ethnic cleansing on people. They make you pay tribute, punitive taxes. So a plague of locusts. There's a plague of locusts that comes along. Right? Now, why? What's, what is a plague of locusts anyway? Ready? Okay. Why does God do this to us? Because you don't have any place for God. Right? You throw God out of your life? Well, guess what? You reap what you sow. So if you don't want God around, well, guess what? You're going to, get, you're going to be subject to the plagues of locusts that nature itself sends. You go against God, you're going against nature. Right? It's not God's fault. You're the, you're the one that created the mess. Right? You violate the laws of God, you mock God, you make fun of God, you kick God out, you don't want God around. Well, that's what happens to you. So Joel then, he says this. In the last days, God declares, okay, who sa is this Joel's interesting opinion? No, mm -hmm. Yahweh is speaking through Joel, right? I'm going to pour out my, my spirit upon all flesh. What? The Ruach? The Panuma? The spirit's going to be poured out upon who? All flesh. Not, I'm only going to pour out my spirit upon people who work at the temple in Jerusalem, the religious people. It's going to be, this is democratization of the Holy Spirit. All flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Stop. 
I thought only men could be religious and women weren't allowed to be. No, God doesn't care. He kicks down the walls between men and women. Very important. And they're going to prophesy. What does prophesy mean? Prophesy doesn't mean predicting the future. What will the lottery number be next Wednesday? That's not prophecy. Prophecy is proclaiming the gospel, the death, burial, resurrection. That's why they speak xenoglossia, so they can go to India like St. Thomas did, according to tradition, and preach the gospel, to bring the gospel around the world. Old, young men and, and daughters, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Okay, stop for a minute. Young men seeing visions, that's okay, but your visions have to be checked by the elders, which is an important thing, right? In our, in our society, we only value what young people say. What does Greta say about the environment? Okay, well, you need to consult the wisdom of older people that have been there, right? So between the council of the elders, that's a very important thing, to have dialogue. Okay, so young men see visions, and old men have dreams. Now, I always kind of wondered about that, but now that I'm an old man, right? So what happens I, when I sleep? I think I, I, think I need like, uh, like one of those CPAP machines or something, right? <laughs> Because I wake up like every hour or two, my mouth is all dried out. I dream that I'm having my teeth extracted or something, you know? And, and I have like weird dreams, you know? I'm like sleeping and all of a sudden, and they're vivid dreams, you know? Like I'm being chased down the streets of Rhinebeck by barred college students wearing Viking helmets. <laughs> and they're waving copies of, of Mao's little red book at me. And I'm like, oh no, don't let him get me on it. And then I wake up, you know? So I have all these weird dreams all the time. Well, this is what happens to you when you get old, I guess. You need a CPAP machine, so you wake up all the time and you remember the dreams, right? Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days, I'm gonna pour out my spirit, stop. Do we care that you're a member of the bourgeoisie or the proletariat? No, we're not communists, we're not Marxist here. The, the Christian church kicks down walls and barriers. There is no class. Who are you? You are a baptized Christian. Who are you? You're a baptized Christian. What does that mean? That means you are equal in rank to the Pope. You are equal in rank to every minister of the day. You are equal in rank to everyone, because we believe in the priesthood of all believers. We're all equal before God in our baptism. Death, burial, resurrection of Christ, extremely important. It's, again, this is democratization, right? And the, whole, and the Spirit is poured out among even slaves, that are owned by masters, yeah, guess what? We don't care about your social status or your race or your ethnic, we don't care about that stuff. We only care that you believe in Jesus. See the point? Very, very important, right? So you're not better than anyone, right? No spiritual elitism here. And I'm gonna show portents in the heaven above, Joel's still talking here, right? And on the earth below. Whenever there's earthquakes, there's a lot of earthquakes that happen uh, in the, uh, especially in the Turkey area, the Middle East, right? Uh, Mount Vesuvius erupts 79 AD, right? What's that? Fire on the mountain, okay? These are si signs of the end times, right? Very important, apocalyptic scenarios. Blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun will be turned into darkness. Did that happen? Yeah, when Jesus was crucified, what happened? The sun was blotted out and the curtain in the temple was ripped open. Why is that? Because there's no profane people on this side and holy people on that side anymore. We come boldly before the throne of grace, right? But the sun itself is blotted out. So the death of Christ on the cross is, is a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. And before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day, is God gonna, is Jesus gonna come again? Yes. Is God going to judge the living and the dead? Yes, he is. You think you're getting away with something now. You corrupt politician, you mass murdering freak, you degenerate. You think you're winning? But guess what? This is the short run. This is temporary. In the long run, you, me, everyone's gonna have to stand before the judgment seat of God on that great and glorious day. God is a God of what? Love, oh God's love, you can do whatever you want. No, you can't. God is a God of justice and it's perfectly balanced. Yeah. Love and mercy and justice are perfectly balanced. What kind of a God would we have if he said, everyone is forgiven, we're universal, everybody goes to heaven, God is love, oh, do whatever you want. Okay, you're gonna show all eternity with Heinrich Himmler and Chairman Mao. What kind of a God would be that? 
So God demands justice. So the second coming of Christ is going to be good news for Christians, bad news for people that scoff and mock God. There will be a time when we're held accountable for everything we've done on earth. Very, very important to remember that. Sometimes we watch the news and it's so depressing I can't stand it. I can't stand it. One bad thing after another after another. Well, guess what? There's going to be a day of God's judgment. And we cling to that hope, right? What do you do about it? Here's what you do about it. Everyone. Who? Everyone. Right? Regardless of your class, your status, your national origin. If you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. You got that? Call on the name of who? Lord. I don't recall calling the name of some politician. Call the name of some book that somebody wrote. Call the name of some philosophy. No, you call on the name of Jesus and you will be saved. For God so loved the what? World. World that he sent his only son. That whoever, whoever, who, whoever, what does that mean? That means all people, right? Whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Today is Pentecost. It's the birthday of the church. Today is Pentecost, 50 days after Easter. Today helps us to understand how they were all together in one room in Jerusalem, but that's not the end that God has in mind. He wanted them to go out into the world and bring the gospel. We, of all people, Northern European types, right? The people who lived in darkness have seen a great light. Our ancestors, we were pagans, barbarians. We sacrificed our teenagers in peak bots, human sacrifice. We enslaved people, we oppressed people, we fought, Vikings, Germans, right? Well, guess what? Christianity brought light into the world. And Christianity today has changed the world in an infinite number of, it's changed the world in so many ways, I'll have to do a sermon on that sometime to explain in detail. Things like hospitals, universities, right? Secular people today, they want you to be a Christian, but they don't want to bow the knee to Christ. Every good thing this world has to offer is a product of the Christian religion being spread and propagated. There's about two billion Christians in the world today. And it gives, gives us hope that there's more than statism, more than hatred, more than race theory, more than class warfare. Jesus transcends it all. And it begins right here on Pentecost Sunday. Amen. Mm -hmm.